Welcome to another edition of Mr. Windsor Teaches Latin Literature. We're going to be looking at Pliny today from the Educast Latin Literature Anthology, An Alarming Dream Comes True. So let's get a bit of context for this piece. So Pliny is writing a letter. Pliny was a prevalent letter writer. He's writing to Novius Maximus uh, about their mutual friend, a guy called Gaius Fannius. Uh, Gaius Fannius has a peculiar dream, which it is said is predictive of Gaius's death. The dream is of uh, an emperor Nero, particularly famous for his dastardly actions while he was in power, who enters the office, sits down, asks for one of Gaius's scrolls about Nero's crimes that he has written, reads them all, and then promptly leaves get a feeling of what the author is actually getting at through his work, we need to get some contextual information about the author himself. It is this guy, Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus, otherwise known as Pliny the Younger. He was a prolific letter writer whose letters were collected and published after his death. His ten volumes of letters allow us an insight into the way Romans thought about common occurrences in Roman society, and in this case, superstition. It allows us this tantalising insight into the psychology of Roman culture. I'll take you on this whistle-stop tour of Pliny's letter. I'm going to be underlining and emboldening certain things in his work according to the following key. So if it's emboldened and in red, it means it has something to do with its word order. So Pliny shifted around the word order in order to create some sort of effect or emphasise something or other. For green, I'm going to be using context and use of content and use of vocabulary. So how is he used, uh, what he's saying to put across a certain point. Blue is anything to do with sound. And finally, purple is anything to do with a particular literary device that Pliny uses in his work that in mind, let's get started with the first line of Pliny's letter. Gaius quidem fanis id quod acidit molto ante praesensit. Gaius fanis in fact predicted what would happen long before, long before it did happen, I put in brackets there. So from the very first line, Pliny is getting in there strong with a sense of foreboding. He knows that Gaius fanis knew what would happen and in the coming lines he's going to tell us what did happen, creating a sense of foreboding. It's notable, however, that Pliny uses the word quidem, meaning in fact, as his second line in between Gaius's first name and his surname, indicating that Pliny takes this dream this, and the interpretation of that dream as fact, and it did actually happen and did actually predict the death of Gaius. Pliny creates a powerful sense of foreboding from this first line, id quod acidit molto ante praesensit, the fact that Gaius had predicted it long before it actually happened creates a sense of foreboding. He then goes on to say, Visus es sibi per nocturnem quietem jacere in lectulo suo. He seemed to him, in the quiet of night, laying on his little couch. So we're talking about Gaius. Uh, so his clear marking is visus est, he seemed, is that uh, creates a sense of something that isn't actually happening in the physical world. Uh, also, nocturnem quietem. Why? Because nothing spooky ever happens in the daytime in Latin literature, with the exception of perhaps one or two. Spookiness always occurs at night. So the fact that we know it's night time means that us as a reader know that something spooky is about to occur. Also, another notable aspect is that Pliny uses a diminutive in lectulo, a little couch. Uh, we're not to believe this, this couch is actually physically small. Um, it's more that Gaius is fond of it, or that he uses it frequently, or that he just generally likes it. Mox imaginatus est venisse neronem restedisse promsisse revolvisse fecisse tunc abisse. So we're told now the content of this hallucination of Gaius. Soon he imagined that Nero came, sat down, asked for a scroll, unrolled it, took another and left. So he's taking these scrolls and reading them one by one. Again, the use of the word imaginatus indicates to us that this isn't physically happening, but it's a hallucination. Also, we have the repetition of the isse sound on the end of these perfect infinitives, uh, which gives us a spooky sense of sibilance. Finally, the fact that he's repeating these perfect infinitives creates a very matter-of-fact account. Yes, this is a hallucination on the part of Gaius or a vision, but Pliny reports it as if it is absolute fact, and then it did actually occur. Expavit et sic interpretatus est. 
So he was terrified, and he interpreted it in this way. Uh, as you would probably be when you see a, first of all, quite dastardly emperor that's been dead for many, many years. Um, they tended to leave a margin of error of about two emperors between they died, when they died, uh, and when they wrote about them in order to avoid obvious things like uh, revenge attacks for uh, a piece of literature that's particularly scathing. The fact that Pliny has written ex parvit, he was terrified at the beginning of the line, gives us a sense of emphatic position. He's moved this word to the beginning of the line in order to emphasise Gaius's terror. Absolutely petrified by the vision of Nero, and Pliny goes on. Tamquam idem sibi futurus asset scribendi finis, qui fuiset ili legendi, et fuit idem. As if the end point of his Gaius's writing would be the same as it was of Nero's reading, and it was the same, et fuit idem, and it was the same. So the first thing that's worth mentioning is that the whole part, of the, the first part of this line is very, very grandiosely phrased. Um, this is. It, Probably part of Pliny's personal style. He did write in this sort of grandiose, overly descriptive tone. The length of this first point of the sen first part of the sentence and it's counterpointed with the brevity of the second part of this sentence for effect. You have a long, wordy first part of the sentence. You counterpoint that with a sudden sharp staccato of the second part, part of the sentence for effect. As if the end point of his writing would be the same as it was of Nero's reading, and it was the same. So how exactly does that mean that Gaius is going to die soon? So you're probably thinking, well, what on earth does that actually mean? So as we know already, Nero has come into the office, he's sat down, he's read a scroll, and he's read two more scrolls, and then he's left. Well, how exactly does this predict Gaius's death? The end point of his reading was the same as Gaius's writing. Well, basically what this means is that Nero is only able to read three, sc three scrolls because those are the only scrolls that Gaius is going to produce in his lifetime. He is going to die before he's able to produce any more work. So the fact that Nero reads the three scrolls and then leaves indicates that Gaius will not have enough time left in his natural life to produce any more than the three scrolls that Nero has read. We know the content of Gaius's hallucination and we now know how exactly that hallucination indicates that Gaius is not long for this world. Pliny goes on. He says, Quod me recordante miseratio subit, quantum vigiladum, vigiliadum, quantum laboris ex hausere frustra. Misery comes over me thinking about it. How many sleepless nights, how much work wasted in vain. So he uses exaggeration. Misery comes over me. Again, very grandiosely phrased for effect. Misery comes over me. He also uses anaphora. The quantum repeated at the beginning of successive clauses is, is designed to emphasize the amount of time that has been used up and lost by Gaius in vain. The fact that he says ex it frustra, wasted, and in vain in the same sentence, indicates that frustra is actually redundant. You don't need that in there. Um, but ulti ultimately, it's, it's a device to emphasize just how pointless Gaius' work has been uh, since, he was, since he died before he was able to complete his work. So Roman authors basically believed that you could achieve immortality in your writing because writing has a sense of permanence about it uh, notwithstanding the fire at the library of alexandria you could achieve immortality through your writing but only if that writing was extant and complete by the time that you died pliny goes on o cursant animo mea mortalitas mea scripta my mortality, my writing springs to mind. So the fact that Gaius has died before his work is, com is complete has got Pliny thinking about what current work he has got going on uh, and how he should get a shift on to get that completed before he dies. The fact that Pliny has inverted the normal word order and put a cursant at the beginning of the sentence gives us an indication that uh, this, is, this sort of just sort of sprung to his mind. So it gives us the impression of springing to mind. Again, he uses anaphora of mea mortalitas, mea scripta, um, and repeats the word mea to bring the attention back to him and from Gaius and Gaius's hallucination. I suppose you could also say something I've not included on this slide is there could be an et or a que somewhere in here to link mea mortalitas and mea scripta, which you could argue is a use of a syndeton to give the writing a sense of urgency. 
So what can he learn from Gaius's hallucination and, Gai and Gaius's sudden death? So my mortality and my writing springs to mind. He ought to get a bit of a shift on with his own work so it is complete before he eventually dies as well. Nec dubito te quoque eadem cogitatione tereri pro istis quae inter manus habes. So at this part, he refers directly to his correspondent, Novius Maximus. Now, Pliny is probably in his mid-40s by the time he's writing this. So he's getting on a bit in years in, in the Roman context. He may not live, uh, uncommon not to live past 60 or so. But Novius Maximus is even older than he is. And so he's nudging Novius Maximus at this point, saying, well, I think this thought terrifies you too, because Novius Maximus is even older than him. And Novius Maximus also has work in progress. So Pliny uses a euphemism, proestis quae inter manus habis, literally meaning due to what you have between your hands. But what he rich, literally means is due to what you have in progress, your current unfinished work. So the final part of the letter, proinde dum supetit vita, vita en eni tamor ot mors quam paucissima quae abolere posit inveniat. So, therefore, while life endures, let us try to ensure that, ensure that death finds as few things to destroy as possible. So, the fact that he's using quam paucissima is a superlative adjective to convey the strength of how he feels on the matter. All Roman writers can achieve that mortality, but they have to make sure that their writing is complete at the point of death. Otherwise, they're going to end up like Gaius, whose work is going to fade into obscurity. And so they, Pliny is using the story of Gaius as a cautionary tale, not only to Roman writers, but to uh, modern writers as well, and writers who are getting on in years who have incomplete work. What is Pliny actually getting at in this letter? What is the point of what he's writing? So first of all, it, he is far from the sort of jocular, insincere tone of Marshall on the same topic of dreams. Pliny takes everything that has been reported in this dream as actual fact. And this is something that scares him. Roman writers believed that they could become immortal through their writing. However, not if that writing is incomplete. And this is something that Pliny is now very worried about, having heard the story of Gaius. Death can come at any time. But this whole cautionary tale of Gaius and Pliny writing to Novius Maximus throws him into an existential crisis. He, despite being suitably grandiose, the sort of writing you might expect from Pliny the Younger, he does actually raise some interesting questions. Questions like, well, what sort of legacy will I leave behind? How can I be remembered after I die? How will people remember me? What? How will people remember my work? And despite Pliny being very grandiose in the way he writes that, I do find that there is a little seed of relatability in Pliny's letter, despite him being perhaps inaccessible to us because he's a wealthy Roman landowner who writes in his free time. But he does raise some interesting questions about legacy, mortality and immortality through this letter. Thank you for listening to my presentation. This has been Mr. Windsor, Latin Literature.